this evening we'll be discussing the 17th chapter of the bhagavad gita which is entitled the divisions of faith in the previous chapter it is concluded that one who does not follow the principles laid down in the scriptures is called a demon and one who follows the scriptural injunctions faithfully is called a deva or a divine person in this chapter krishna is going to describe the divisions of faith in response to a question by arjuna which is the opening verse of this 17th chapter arjuna asks krishna my dear krishna describe sorry arjuna says o oh krishna what is the situation of a person who does not follow the scriptures but worships according to his own imagination arjuna is asking about somebody who does not follow the scriptural injunctions but according to his own imagination he is worshiping so is such a person in goodness or passion or ignorance this is arjuna's question so shrila prabhupada explains what does this question mean Shila Prabhupada says, there are some people who create some sort of God by selecting a human being, a powerful human being or a charismatic human being and placing their faith in such a self-created God, they worship that person. So what is their position? Is it possible for such people to actually progress in spiritual life are they able to actually progress and reach the highest perfection of spirituality now those who don't follow the scriptural injunctions but they have some faith and according to their faith they select someone or something they want to worship now what is the possibility that such people will be successful in their worship so arjuna wants to know about this and the rest of the chapter is krishna's uh, explanation of something called divisions of faith so krishna says in response to arjuna's question according to the modes of material nature acquired by a person there can be three kinds of faith if a person is situated in goodness mode of goodness then the person's faith is in the mode of goodness if someone is situated in the mode of passion then that person's faith is also in the mode of passion and if somebody else is in situated in mode of ignorance then that person's faith also is in mode of ignorance so according to the situation in a particular guna or mode of material nature their faith also will be accordingly in that particular mode so it is explained by shrila prabhupad that uh, if somebody does not follow the scriptural directions or injunctions or rules and regulations but they whimsically or according to their own imagination they do whatever they like they worship whom or they want to worship without any reference to scriptures such people are immediately coming under the influence of the three material modes now the association of any living being with the material modes has been going on since a very 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 long time so what happens according to their particular association with these 
three modes, they get a certain type of mentality. That mentality can be either a mentality of goodness or mentality of passion or mentality of ignorance. And accordingly their faith also will be in the mode of goodness, passion or ignorance. Now, Srila Prabhupada explains, blind faith, irrespective of in which mode they may be situated, is not going to help any person. Spiritually, it's not going to help anybody. Blind faith is totally useless. So, uh, Krishna explains further, according to one's existence under a particular mode of material nature, they evolve a kind of faith. So, Srila Prabhupada explains, everybody has got some kind of faith. Everyone has. But the faith is considered to be in goodness or passion or ignorance according to the mentality of the person. The real fact is every living being is originally soul, spirit soul, spiritual being. So a spiritual being originally being a part and parcel of Krishna, the Supreme Spirit, they are not situated in any of these three material modes. They are situated in the spiritual, uh, spiritual platform or spiritual nature. But when one forgets one's relationship with Krishna, then one is placed in this material world and in the material world one, one develops his or her own mentality, his or her own situation. And according to that situation, they are not anymore in transcendental faith, but their faith becomes um, contaminated if I may use that word, by the one of the three modes. So, uh, one situation in Krishna consciousness is the way to elevate oneself to the perfectional stage of coming to the transcendental position. If one does not follow the path of self-realization through devotional service, then one will certainly be simply entangled in one of the three gunas. That's why in this world we find different types of faith and according to the different types of faith, faith people have, they are of different religions. They are different religious principles. So, uh, that is explained by Krishna further. Those in the mode of goodness, they worship the devatas. Those in the mode of passion, they worship the demons. And those in the mode of ignorance, they worship ghosts and spirits. So, Srila Prabhupada explains, uh, actually scriptures teach us to worship only the Supreme Lord, Krishna. Everyone is meant to worship Krishna. Krishna is the only worshipable Lord or God. But somebody is not situated on the spiritual uh, plane or spiritual platform. So if they situate themselves in mode of goodness, then they choose to worship devatas. Who are the devatas? They are controllers in this world, but they are subordinate to Krishna and they include personalities like Brahma, Shiva, Indra, Chandra, Surya, like that. And there are many, many, many of these devatas. 
<coughs> similarly those who are in the mode of passion they worship demons Srila Prabhupada gives an example during the second world war a man in Calcutta was worshipping Hitler what's the reason because thanks to that war he had amassed a lot of wealth by dealing in the black market so people select some powerful person to worship and they think anyone can be worshipped as God and the same result will be obtained simply by doing some worship but this is not the fact there is no spiritual benefit at all by worshipping according to one's own imagination. It's not going to work. That worship is not going to work. Now, there are people who are in the mode of ignorance. They worship dead spirits. That means they go to some tomb of some dead person and they worship the tomb. In remote villages in India, even now, there are some people who worship ghosts. Particularly, they go to a forest outside the village and if they come to know that some ghost is living in some tree, they worship that tree. So, all these different kinds of worship of devatas or demons or ghosts and spirits, it's not God worship. The real worship of God is based on the scriptural uh, injunction that only Krishna is worshipable, the transcendental Lord, the Supreme Lord, only He is worshipable. Then Krishna says about these people who uh, do not follow scriptures, they sometimes undergo severe austerities and out of pride or out of lust or out of some material attachment they torture their body while undergoing such austerities and they are also giving trouble to the super soul within their heart such people are known to be demons example is Hiranyakashipu in the Srimad Bhagavatam we find the example of Hiranyakashipu he was engaged in very, very severe austerity for getting some power equal to that of Brahma. And such a um, austerity that uh, Hiranyakashipu underwent was totally unproductive ultimately as far as uh, spiritual advancement and development is concerned. Another example is people who fast for some political purpose. Scriptures recommend fasting for spiritual advancement. But there are people who take to fasting for some political reasons. They think that by doing such fasting, they can actually force uh, other people to actually accept their proposal. But actually, such fasting is considered unauthorized and certainly it is very disturbing to others. There is no spiritual benefit at all by performing such austerities. They are neither approved by the scriptures nor approved by the Supreme Lord Krishna and their, the result of doing such austerities is that they are considered as demons and because of that they really are unable to come out of material bondage. They go deeper into material bondage and they degrade themselves. Then Krishna describes not only faith according to these three uh, modes, uh, there are also different kinds of foods in three different modes which people eat. Uh, there are people in the mode of goodness, they eat foods of a particular type. People in the mode of goodness take 
foods which are in the mode of goodness what is the characteristic of foods in the mode of goodness they increase the duration of life they purify one's existence and they give strength health happiness and satisfaction such nourishing foods are sweet juicy fattening and palatable so shri la prabhupad explains the purpose of food is to increase the duration of life purify the mind and aid bodily strength that is the real purpose of taking food in the past great authorities selected those foods which actually help us to increase our duration of life to help us to purify the mind and improve our bodily strength such foods are uh, milk products sugar rice wheat vegetables fruits these foods are dear to those in the mode of goodness all these foods are pure by nature they are quite different from untouchable things like meat wine now when it is mentioned that foods in the mode of goodness are fattening such fatty foods in the mode of goodness have no connection with animal flesh which is obtained from killing animals animal fat is best obtained from milk which is the most wonderful of all types of foods there is no need to kill any animal for getting um, animal fat protein is amply available in split peas dal whole wheat etc then there are foods in the mode of passion such foods are described as those foods which are too bitter too sour salty pungent dry too much of uh, spices which are very very hot so they are like the people in the mode of passion such foods cause pain distress and disease so what happens when people take such a uh, food which is in the mode of passion overly mixed with too much of chilies they cause misery by producing mucus in the stomach leading to disease then foods which are in the mode of ignorance are described by krishna as those foods which are cooked more than 3 hours before being consumed food which is tasteless stale putrid decomposing unclean such foods are liked by people in the mode of ignorance so essentially these are not fresh foods these are all stale foods they are decomposing so they are of a very bad odor but somehow people in the mode of ignorance like such foods they are attracted to eating such foods because they are decomposing they give a bad smell but people in the mode of ignorance are attracted by such food also remnants of food may be eaten only when they are part of a meal that was first offered to the supreme lord krishna or first eaten by pure devotees otherwise any other remnants of food are considered to be in the mode of ignorance the best food one can eat is the remnants of that which is offered to supreme lord krishna in bhagavad gita this is explained krishna accepts preparations of vegetables fruits grains etc when offered with devotion therefore to make food antiseptic eatable palatable for all persons one should offer uh, pure vegetarian food to the supreme lord and only partake remnants of such food then krishna describes sacrifice in three modes it says of sacrifices that sacrifice performed according to duty according to scriptural rules and regulations with no expectation of reward is of the nature of goodness the general tendency is that people want to offer sacrifice for some material benefit but such sacrifices are not 
recommended in the scriptures. Besides that, even if somebody does any sacrifice which is recommended in the scriptures, the aim should be simply to do that sacrifice as a matter of duty. For example, somebody offers a ritual in some temple. Now, if they do that for some material gain or material benefit, and that is not in the mode of goodness. One should go to a temple as a matter of duty. Offer respect to the Supreme Lord, again as a matter of duty. Or offer some flowers or eatables, some fruits to the deity of Krishna as a matter of duty. But everyone thinks, what is the use of going to temple simply to worship God without any material benefit? So that is the wrong understanding people generally have. It is a duty of every civilized person to obey the injunctions of the scriptures and offer respect to the Supreme Lord according to the scriptural directions. Then Krishna describes sacrifice performed in the mode of passion, sacrifices which are performed for some material benefit, performed ostentatiously out of pride is the nature of mode of passion. Sometimes sacrifice and rituals are performed for elevation to heavenly planets. Such uh, sacrifices certainly are in the mode of passion. Or for some material benefits even in this life, they are also in the mode of passion. Then sacrifice in the mode of ignorance is described as that sacrifice in which no spiritual food is distributed, no Vedic mantras or hymns are chanted, no remuneration is given to the priests and such sacrifices which are performed without any faith. Such sacrifices are of the nature of ignorance. So therefore, faith in the mode of ignorance is actually faithlessness. There is no faith, there is no real faith. Just like somebody may worship some devatas simply to make a lot of money. And then what do they do with the money? They spend it for recreation. They don't follow the scriptural injunctions how money should be spent. Such show of religiosity is not at all genuine. And all such people are in the mode of ignorance. And because of such um, sacrifices being performed, they become more and more demoniac. They do not benefit themselves, neither do they benefit anybody else in the human society. Next, Krishna describes austerity in the three modes. Austerity in the three modes is explained by Krishna that in each of the modes, there is austerity that can be done with the body, austerity of the mind and austerity of speech. So he describes first of all, what is the scriptural recommendation for performing austerity of the body. So austerity of the body as recommended in the scriptures consists of worship of the Supreme Lord, worship of the qualified pure Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, Worship of the spiritual master, worship of superiors like father and mother, respectable superiors, and austerity of the body also consists of cleanliness, simplicity, celibacy, and non violence. So, these are the austerities of the body recommended in the scriptures. So, Srila Prabhupada explains one should offer or learn to offer respect to the Supreme Lord to the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas, to superiors like father and mother, or anybody who is conversant with Vedic wisdom. S such persons are worshipable and they should be offered proper respect. Then one should practice uh, cleanliness both external and internal. This has already been discussed earlier. External cleanliness is taking bath and wearing clean clothes, etc. Maintaining surroundings clean. And internal cleanliness is 
by chanting Hare Krishna, one can cleanse the heart of all the material contamination. Then one should also learn to be simple in behavior, that is simplicity. And one should not do anything which is not sanctioned by scriptural injunctions. For example, one should not indulge in sex outside of married life. Because in the scriptures, sex life is allowed only in marriage. This is called celibacy. Then austerity of speech as recommended in the scriptures consists of speaking truthfully, speaking beneficially, avoiding speech that is offensive. One should also recite Vedic scriptures regularly. So Srila Prabhupada explains one should not speak in such a way that such speech will agitate the minds of others. One should not talk nonsense. While speaking in spiritual circles, it is a common practice to quote authentic Vedic scriptures. So one should be able to back up whatever they state from the scriptures. At the same time, the talk should be pleasing to the ears. By such discussions, human society will derive the highest benefit and people will be able to make advancement in spiritual life. And there is also limitless talk of Vedic literature. One should study the Vedic literature. This is austerity of speech. Then austerity of mind as prescribed in the Vedic literature is serenity, simplicity, gravity, self-control and purity of thought. These are the austerities of the mind. What is meant by serenity? Serenity means to be satisfied within the mind. Satisfaction of the mind can be obtained only by taking the mind away from thoughts of sense enjoyment. The more we think of enjoying our senses, the more the mind becomes dissatisfied. The best course to divert the mind away from sense enjoyment is to divert the mind towards Vedic literature, which is full of satisfying stories like the Puranas, Mahabharata, Ramayana, etc. One can take advantage of all this knowledge and thus purify the mind. The mind also should be devoid of duplicity. That means one should think of the welfare of all the people of the world. The mind should be trained to think of others' welfare. The best training for the mind is gravity in thought. Gravity means uh, we should observe silence. Silence means one is always thinking of self-realization. The person in Krishna consciousness, because a person in Krishna consciousness is always very seriously interested in self-realization, observes perfect silence in this sense. Control of the mind means detaching the mind from sense enjoyment, as has already been explained. One should not deviate from Krishna consciousness and thus avoid sense enjoyment. In this way, the mind can be controlled. To purify one's nature is possible by becoming Krishna conscious. So one should be straightforward in one's dealings and in this way purify one's existence. These threefold austerity of body, of speech and mind, practiced by those whose aim is not to benefit themselves materially, but simply to please the Supreme Lord. Such austerity is in the mode of goodness. Then there is austerity in the mode of passion. What is the nature of uh, austerity in the mode of passion? It is described ostentatious austerities which are performed to gain respect, honor. Uh, such austerities are considered to be in the mode of passion. The results of such austerities in the mode of passion are neither stable nor permanent. Sometimes people, they execute some austerities simply to attract others' attention, to get some respect, to get some honor in society. All such uh, 
austerities are a uh, waste of time sometimes people organize uh, others to wash their feet to offer them some gifts uh, as if they are very very great persons in society or spiritually very powerful people or advanced people all such artificial arrangements for simply getting some honor and respect any austerity they may do is useless and the results are temporary and they are not at all ultimately of any use then austerities which are performed foolishly by means of obstinate self torture or to destroy or injure others they are austerities in the mode of ignorance again the example of hiranyakashipu he was torturing his body by doing very severe austerities but ultimately what happened he did get some power but he misused that power extraordinary power he got by such austerity and then he was killed by the supreme lord because of his misuse of the power he had obtained that way so to undergo austerities for something which is impossible he is certainly in the mode of ignorance he thought he can become god hiranyakashipu he thought he can become god nobody can become god god is god and everyone else is simply subordinate to god so he thought somehow he can become god by amassing a lot of power through such austerity in the mode of ignorance but ultimately because he misused his power to harass innocent people saintly people he was uh, killed by the supreme lord then three kinds of charity krishna describes charity in the mode of goodness is that charity which is given out of duty at the proper time at the proper place to a worthy person without any expectation of return so such charity is a mode of goodness in the vedic literature it is clearly uh, recommended to give charity to a person engaged in spiritual activities charity is never recommended to be given indiscriminately always spiritual perfection is the consideration for giving charity uh, sometimes uh, people give charity at a holy place or during a eclipse but they should give such charity even at such holy places or at auspicious times uh, or at uh, certain occasions only to a qualified brahmana or a pure devotee or in the temple they should offer it to the supreme lord such charities uh, should be given without any consideration of any material gain or material benefit sometimes people give charity to the poor people without considering whether the poor man is worthy of receiving charity but giving charity without considering the qualification of the recipient is no use because ultimately uh, by giving such charity to unworthy persons they don't make any spiritual advancement now what is charity in the mode of passion charity in the mode of passion is done with expectation of some return with a desire for some favorable results or in a grudging mood so such charity is again useless just like after giving some charity sometimes people uh, repent why did i give charity why did i spend money in such a way so all such charity is again useless then charity in the mode of ignorance is described as charity performed at improper place given to unworthy persons without proper respect given with contempt all such charities are charity in the mode of ignorance contributions shri prabhupada explains contributions for indulgence in intoxication are not encouraged in the scriptures such charity if at all done is in the mode of ignorance 
such charity is not beneficial for anybody it encourages sinful people to actually become more sinful so charity should be given to a suitable person if the person is not worthy of receiving charity then such charity also is in the mode of ignorance krishna concludes this chapter by describing what is called as om tat sat so krishna says from the beginning of creation these three syllables om tat sat have been used to indicate the supreme absolute truth they were uttered by brahmanas while chanting the vedic hymns during sacrifices for the satisfaction of the supreme lord so the real way to do sacrifice or to perform austerities or to give charity is to perform any of these in the mode of goodness with the aim of pleasing the supreme so therefore all such activities austerities charity or sacrifices should be aimed at the supreme lord krishna by using these three syllables om tat sat one who acts without following the regulations of scriptures will not attain the absolute truth will not be able to transfer oneself to the spiritual world will not become free from bondage will not make any spiritual progress so everything bhagavad gita recommends any work done should be done for om tat sat or done for pleasing the supreme personality of god krishna then only one will be able to return to the kingdom of god so krishna explains uh, transcendentalists who perform sacrifices or give charity or undergo austerity beginning always with om to attain the supreme they are properly engaging in such activities then one should perform sacrifice austerity and charity with the word tat the purpose of such transcendental activities is to get free from material entanglement then uh, the absolute truth is the objective of devotional service, sacrifices and it is indicated by the word sat so such works of sacrifice austerity or charity which are performed to please the supreme are beneficial for the person performing these activities finally krishna concludes the last verse of this chapter by saying sacrifices austerities and charities performed without faith in the supreme lord a non permanent regardless of whatever rituals or whatever way such activities are done they are useless both in this life and they are useless in the future also in the next life also so that is the <clears throat> description so we should understand that uh, faith doesn't mean in conclusion faith doesn't mean blind faith it's not simply that somebody thinks i have faith in doing something if i do that with some so called faith i believe like people sometimes ask do you believe in god actually it is not a question of whether somebody believes in god or not god is real god is the actual supreme personality so uh, real faith is backed up by transcendental knowledge spiritual knowledge proper understanding so therefore uh, the scriptures recommend that one should approach a bona fide spiritual master and actually get educated in the subject matter of god and then actually practice spiritual activities recommendations of spiritual practice for the sake of actually developing the proper transcendental faith by which one can actually make progress and uh, 
attain perfection in spiritual life. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.